Good morning from a very late evening in Brisbane. Today I would like to share some thoughts with you relating to the resurgence of the needle coke market and sustained price support. While from a market perspective, this development is very welcomed, it begs a question relating to the ability of the needle coke value chain to provide these volumes, especially as the demand is exclusively based on ultra premium grade needle coke. We will further examine the considerable influence that DCE feedstock chemistry has on the quality of needle coke. During the course of the presentation, I would like to share some aspects driving the resurgence of the needle coke market, both in terms of graphite electrodes for electric arch furnaces or EAFs, and additionally, the evolving demand for lithium ion battery market based on the growth of electric vehicles. There is a direct link between the in situ performance of needle coke or synthetic graphite in application and DCU feedstock uh, quality parameters. As examples, we will look at the inherent quality factors associated with coal tar and petroleum needle cokes. I would like to share some thoughts on a different approach as well to broadening the scope of DCU needle coke feeds by discussing options gas to liquid technology offers, especially in line with the demand for cleaner fuels in the future. Lastly, I would like to examine some beneficial attributes of DCUs and how they enable a wide array of solutions for the transition to cleaner energy markets and environmental sustainability. Historically, the necessity to smelt scrap steel in electric arc furnaces has determined the market demand for both graphite electrodes and needle coke. Over the last decade, the demand for and price of needle coke has diminished essentially due to the global oversupply of steel. A resurgent global market for graphite electrodes within the last two years is witnessed by a substantial planned EAF capacity increase in China over the medium term. The sustained demand will be dependent on the ability to supply high quality needle cokes on a consistent basis. Needle coke quality relies on a high purity and a highly ordered coke structure on each of the crystalline micro and macro scales. However, when these purity and structural characteristics are compromised at the beginning of the value chain, these slight imperfections get amplified by thermal treatments throughout the remainder of the value chain. Thus, it is possible to draw a direct link between DCU feedstock quality at the beginning of the value chain and the in situ performance of a graphite electrode within an EAF at the end of it. With the advent of electric vehicles, the demand for needle coke to support the development of anodes for lithium ion batteries will continue to provide sustained growth well into the future. By way of example, a 6% increase in the electric vehicle market drives a 250 kiloton per annum increase in the demand for needle coke. If one considers that the historical demand for needle coke in the graphite electrode market has been in the order of 1 million tons per annum, this will have a substantial impact. The purity and structure requirements of needle coke in the lithium ion battery industry are primarily aimed at maximizing coulombic capacity and electrical conductivity. Battery anodes are usually based on a mixture of natural and synthetic graphite, although they have varying characteristics. The, while natural graphite is more readily available and at the moment comparatively cheaper, it is also usually has a higher comparative ash content. The enhanced performance demands of batteries will be driven by the purity and the structural order of the synthetic graphite. In other words, 
the battery application will demand only the highest or ultra premium grade needle coke. Although a rather simplistic comparison, examining needle coke value chain is much like baking a cake in that the quality of the ingredients at the beginning of the value chain by and large determine the quality of the product at the end of it. In the same way, the inherent chemistry of DCU feeds largely determine the quality of needle coke produced as it, this is where the phase transition from liquid to solid occurs and thus where the structural order is generated. The remainder of the value chain essentially consists of a thermal of process, uh, sorry, of thermal treatments, namely calcination, electrode baking, terminating in electrode graphitization to a temperature of 2850. Thus, the composition and of the DCU feed will very much determine the eventual in situ performance of needle coke in either an electric arc furnace or lithium ion battery. The structural order of needle coke determines the majority of synthetic graphite performance measures, including the coefficient of thermal expansion, the thermal conductivity, and the electrical conductivity. The two most important factors affecting the structural order of needle coke include the presence of inert solids and the thermal reactivity of the DCU feedstock. Inert solids in the DCU feed inclusive of inherent metals, process catalysts, and semi-carbonaceous MIQ retard the development of the mesophase and physically obstruct the laydown of parallel carbon planes, causing structural imperfections. In some cases, catalysts left over from the upstream processes may additionally catalyze oxidative polymerization during delayed coking, basically further promoting structural disorder. The second influence includes the thermal stability of organic molecules during delayed coking and its influence on the structural order of the coke. Typically, thermally unstable organic families may include asphaltines, alkanes, thiols, phenols, and amides. During delayed coking, any thermal instability increases the reaction rate, leading to premature viscosity increase, increase during, during mesophase development, promoting a greater degree of disorder within the coke structure. In contrast, DCU feeds with a higher concentration of pure aromatics decrease the rate of viscosity increase and promote structural order during the phase transition from liquid to solid. As the needle coke is a highly valued commodity, obviously there would be a benefit to increasing the yield. In the accompanying photo micrograph to the right of the slide, is shown the ability of a low viscosity liquid crystal, also known as a mesosphere, to coalesce around a solid carbon structure. As, the term, as determined or mentioned, the thermal stability and solids content of needle coke determine, is determined by the structural order of, of the coke in many case, in many, I'm sorry, on many scales. These imperfections lead to reduced real density and increased coefficient of thermal expansion, or CTE, within the graphite. Crystalline imperfections on the nanoscale may, in extreme cases, lead to electrode cracking on the macro scale. In the accompanying, accompanying diagrammatic insert at the center of the slide, a highly ordered flow domain microstructure ex exhibiting um, parallel porosity of needle cokes is shown. This is the ideal microstructure to support the distribution of electrical charge or thermal energy without resistance. In order to show the effect of inert material in causing structural disorder, a scanning electron micrograph with a 15,000 times magnification is shown on the right of the slide. 
The catalyst particle, shown as a darker sphere within a red marking, provides a physical obstruction around which the microstructure forms. I would also like to briefly explain the individual quality aspects of needle coke based on coal tar and petroleum residues. Firstly, coal tar pitch is produced in a blast furnace and is a product of destructive distillation at temperatures in excess of 1000 degrees centigrade. Given this extreme thermal exposure, coal tar pitch has a high concentration of pure aromatics. This aromaticity has both beneficial and detrimental influences. On the positive side, highly aromatic DCU feeds exhibit enhanced thermal stability and produce coke with a high degree of structural order, which is beneficial. However, on the contrary, the high concentration of pure aromatics increases the carcinogenic potential and produces semi-carbonaceous solids known as primary MIQ, which given their sticky nature, for lack of a better word, are difficult to filter. The carcinogenic potential and carbonaceous semi-solids originate in the coal tar blast furnace, but their detrimental effects are realized during delayed coking and amplified further down the value chain. Another factor traditionally associated with coal chemistry is the predominance of thermally stable nitrogen heterocycles and their detrimental influence during puffing on electrode cracking. Moving over to petroleum needle coke, while a range of needle coke grades have historically been produced using different petroleum residues, by far the most predominant DCU feed is FCCDO. Any thermal instability associated with the molecules is largely eradicated within the FCC reactor as reactive aliphatic and asphaltene molecules are usually instantly destroyed, converting to coke on the catalyst and reducing its reactivity. The control of the catalyst content in FCC decant oil is imperative in limiting structural deformation during delayed coking. Another factor traditionally associated with crude oil chemistry is the predominance of thermally stable sulfur heterocycles and their detrimental influence on puffing during uh, during the electrode graphitization cycle, leading to possible electrode cracking. However, it may be possible to broaden the scope of investigation to look for new needle coats that do not have inherent limitations built into the source. With this in mind, I would like to examine gas to the potential that gas to liquids technology offers as an unlikely candidate. Well, the primary focus of GTL is the production of liquid fuels. It could provide an unlikely solution for the needle coke industry. As may be seen in the, in the pr process flow schematic, natural gas composed largely of methane is utilized in steam reforming to produce carbon monoxide and hydrogen, usually known as synthesis gas. Synthesis gas is converted to alkanes using the Fischer-Tropsch reaction, while downstream separation provides gasoline, petrol, diesel, lubricants, and jet fuel. The GTL also produces a heavier waxy oil fraction with a chain length exceeding C20. Waxy oils are at first glance an unlikely needle coke feedstock. However, upon closer examination, they present many benefits. I would like to note at this point that the coal to oil process as commercialized in South Africa also produces synthesis gas and can be converted to a similar alkane range. The work conducted on the wax oil fraction in the next slide was conducted on CTL waxy oil. Although as both processes use synthesis gas, their products are very much the same. 
Of course, CTL has a larger greenhouse gas component than GTL and is thus less of a realistic option in the current climate conscious environment. The waxy oil fraction is an attractive option, firstly, as it is devoid of nitrogen and sulfur. As has been alluded to in previous slides, nitrogen and sulfur have detrimental effects through the needle coke value chain from delayed coking through to electrode puffing. Of course, this additionally removes any SOX and NOx emissions potential. An obvious concern is the lack of inherent aromaticity, one of the biggest factors usually associated with needle coke structural order and thus performance. Prior to delayed coking, any remaining FT catalyst needs to be removed from wax oil. It then undergoes thermal pretreatment at 400 degrees centigrade to stabilize higher alkanes and eradicate organic oxygenates. Although the fischer tropsch reaction primarily produces alkanes, a small amount of available oxygen is incorporated into the higher alkanes, typically as alcohols or carboxylic acids. As thermally instable oxygenates may lead to structural imperfections during the late coking, their eradication during thermal pretreatment is essential. At the onset of the delayed coking reaction at around 460 degrees, the stabilized higher alkanes slowly cyclize to form cycloalkanes, which is then followed by rapid dehydrogenation, leading to the in situ creation of optimal three to six, seven rings aromatics. This in situ aromaticity promotes optimal mesophase development, resulting in a coke exhibiting high structural order. As aromaticity is produced and consumed in situ, it is within a closed system and poses no carcinogenic potential. Being a synthetic product, it contains no contaminants, namely vanadium, nickel, nitrogen, sulfur, or semi-carbons. The benefit of contaminant eradication at the source is highly advantageous for the remainder of the value chain. Wax oil calcine coke also offers high purity, high structural order, high real density, high electrical conductivity, and lower CTEs typically associated with ultra premium needle cokes. This is currently based on research results, although it would form an interesting commercial concept. On the right hand side of the photomicrograph, a photomicrograph of wax oil is shown showing these flow domains with a high structural order. In the last two slides, I would like to change pace from the nanoscale to the commercial scale in order to demonstrate the practical value of understanding DCU chemistry and how this may be utilized to enable novel solutions in a changing world. Within the anode coke space, it is widely known that the quality of anode coke has been in decline, specifically in terms of sulfur, nickel, and vanadium. This is largely attributed to the knock-on effects of processing heavier crudes. However, to address this detrimental quality factor, the aluminium industry has taken the initiative by developing inert technology named EDC, if you'll forgive my pronunciation. This is currently a joint venture between two of the world's largest aluminium smelting companies, namely Alcoa and Rio Tinto. Based on information on their website, this technology offers a substantial alteration to the current smelting process. As it uses inert technology, or inert anode technology rather, it excludes coke 
And one, and the, one of the greatest benefits being there are no CO2 shocks or NOx emissions. According to their website, this technology, which is set for commercialization in 2024, has a host of additional benefits. The current value proposition for fuel coke may be limited in comparison with the DCU dislit fraction counterparts. However, delay coking is an enabling process, producing valuable distillates as it concentrates a large percentage of the sulfur within the coke fraction, which acts as a natural sulfur sink, for lack of a better word. This is enabled by the phase change from liquid to solid within the DCU, as a large percentage of the sulfur is trapped within the solid coke matrix, this offers potential opportunity to eliminate it from the value chain, massively reducing potential SOX emissions during energy applications. Partial calcination of the green fuel coke reduces the volatile content, producing an environmentally stable product. The American Environmental Protection Agency, or EPA, have additionally noted that partially calcined coke is environmentally stable and not a hazard. Non-fuel applications for fuel coke could include construction fillers, asphalt fillers for road or roads, resin encapsulation, or landfill materials. Additionally, the substantial emissions benefit derived from this approach could potentially outweigh its value in the energy market as the transition to cleaner energy fuels inevitably occurs over the medium term. While this approach is perhaps my opinion at the moment, it is based on sound DCU chemistry and could be used in rebranding the DCU as an environmental enabler to maximize the marketing potential offered in a climate conscious era. I can personally attest to the business development value of DCU Cokes, which offer environmental benefits based on my own experience within the binder pitch, anode coke, fuel coke, and needle coke markets. Another current development potentially promoting refinery reform in future is a global implementation of IMO 2020 by the International Marine Organization to reduce the sulfur content of shipping fuels from a maximum of 3.5% to 0.5%. This substantial reduction requirement offers the DCU industry an attractive enabling option as, as a multifaceted solution provider. By way of explanation, IMO 2020 would effectively exclude the larger proportion of traditional heavy fuel oils from shipping markets. However, as long as there is a requirement for liquid fuels based on crude oil, these associated heavy residuals will be produced, whether they have a market or not. As dumping is not a reasonable option, the potential to create distressed products is high. However, DCUs are able to convert these heavy residues into lighter hydrocarbons or hydrocarbon distillates similar to marine gas oil with a sulfur content of less than 0.5% to in part replace the market void left by the removal of heavy fuel oil. Additionally, the phase change from liquid to solid within the DCU offers potentially environmentally sustainable solutions to lock sulfur within the coke matrix and reduce SOX emissions. The enabling options offered by the DCU to promote environmentally or environmental sustainability and rescue markets, while laudable, also require financial viability, of course.
With this in mind, one may consider the integration of these markets. As 80% of international goods trade is based on marine transport, it is not reasonable to consider an international port being excluded on the basis of it being unable to reship or refuel ships in a consistent and compliant manner. Thus, if the, if the DCU were used to enable marine trade and the excess fuel coke produced were burned with associated SOX emissions, of course, that would very much negate the philosophy behind IMO 2020. With this in mind, a non-fuel application for the coke may be the potential and may lead to, sorry, the potential for cross-market subsidies. Thus, the impact of IMO 2020 could provide potential opportunities for merchant DCUs within coastal bunker fuel hubs to maximize the logistical benefits offered by locating or lo localizing the value chain to encompass feed, process, and market in the same vicinity. I worked on this conceptual option with the South African government some years back and was kindly allowed to use it in partial fulfillment of my postgrad studies. As a parting comment, the impact of DCU chemistry cannot merely be confined to R&D or process laboratories. The ability to establish and execute commercial test run protocols is a substantial benefit. As seen in the diagram, it is possible to conduct industrial height zone profiling to determine any associated variation in the structure or nature of needle coaxes or other coaxes. This provides valuable information on the chemical and physical attributes of coke produced within different height zones of the drum. This is especially useful when considering in-mine blending of different petroleum residues. With a lack, oh sorry, with a knowledge of the individual feed characteristics, one can establish the degree of true hybridization of the component feeds by examining characteristics of the coke, which may include nitrogen, sulfur, metals, and microstructure. In conclusion, it may be worthwhile to recap some of the salient points. Many of the quality issues associated with needle coke based on coal tar and petroleum sources can be tracked back to their source, which further relates to downstream thermal amplification of these defects. Increased process costs and a reduction of in situ performance. Secondly, there will be a sustained demand for needle coke with associated price support from both the electrode or graphite electrode market and the lithium ion battery market. However, this will be dependent on the ability to supply these larger needle coke volumes in the ultra premium range. GTL wax oil offers an unlikely opportunity as a candidate needle coke feedstock addressing many of the quality issues at the source. While I'm not trying to suggest that wax oil is the future of needle coke, it does serve to demonstrate the value of evaluating even the most unlikely of candidate needle coke precursors. The DCU also offers substantial enabling opportunities to rescue heavy residues in potential distress and contribute towards environmental sustainability targets. As my concluding remark, DCU product chemistry, development initiatives, and their safety considerations cannot be limited to the laboratory. 
Its potential impact on value chain viability requires extensive and diverse consultation. I think back to my own history and stress the value of chatting to DCU shift operators at three o'clock in the morning over a cup of coffee in the control room and incorporating their valuable inputs to realize these new developments within a zero harm production and product stewardship policy. As any scientist would test, a presentation would not be complete without a litany of references, which are provided in the next slides. I would be happy to try and answer any questions now, or if you would feel more comfortable by popping me an email, I would be happy to try and help out. I thank you very much for your attention and wish you a very pleasant day.